Good morning, Manitoba. I'm Larry McIntosh, and I'll be your host for the next hour and every Saturday morning from 8 to 9, right here in 680 CJOB and at CJOB.com. Thanks for tuning in. I want to take a few minutes just to talk about uh, Tuesday night. Uh, Shelley and I went to DeLuca's and had an amazing evening. It, uh, it was cooking classes that we went to. And if you haven't been to DeLuca's on Portage, they have an amazing store, a lot of Italian specialty items. And we went to the cooking uh, classes downstairs. And Carla and Tony from DeLuca's treated us fantastic. You, you see how you make the food. You don't prepare it, but you see how you make it. Uh, you eat it, and then uh, you get the recipes. And we actually got up to go shopping afterwards. So it was an amazing evening. So highly recommend DeLuca's on Portage if you get a chance. Check out the store or book the cooking classes. Now, this is a very special weekend. There's lots to celebrate. It's Mother's Day tomorrow, so happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. And, of course, it's Manitoba Day on Monday, and Manitoba is going to be 144 years old, and we'll chat about that a little bit later on. My guest this morning is Don Peterkin, Chief Operations Officer of Assiniboine Park Conservancy. Good morning, Don. How are you? Good morning. I'm very good, thank you. Conservancy? Did I get... Conservancy. You got it right. Close? See, I was so very paranoid right. about saying that it's not going to be right the whole show. You might as well know that right now. Well, we'll just make our mistakes and carry on. <laughs> there you go. So, the park. What's new at the park? Well, of course, the big push now is to get ready for the opening of Journey to Churchill. We've announced July 3rd is the opening date at noon oh. for anyone that wants to be first in line. Um, but actually, before that, we have a royal visit coming up and... Um, we have our, our guests, um, Prince Charles and Camilla, going to be uh, at the park. Oh, wow. Um, going to tour the pavilion, uh, the Winnie the Pooh uh, gallery in the pavilion. It's actually the 100th anniversary of the the start of Winnie the Pooh, so that's uh, interesting. And then um, Prince Charles will be over to meet Hudson and go through a PRT session, feed Hudson, and be the first official visitor to the Gateway to the Arctic Building in Journey to Churchill. So on July 3rd, if I kind of hang out near Hudson, would I get to meet the prince? No, no, that's mm-hmm. on May 21st. The, uh, so I, oh, yeah, right. That July 3rd is when it's opening, right? July 3rd is when it's, when it's opening. All right, so if I hang outside the gate, maybe, no, nothing, eh? Well, you could uh, <laughs> watch him go by, but... Wave? Uh, I'll wave. We, you can wave. I like Absolutely. royalty. I'm sure there'll be lots of people who want to uh, uh, take the opportunity to see them. I remember when the Queen was here, right? Not the last time, the time before, and we were like 10 feet from her when she walked by, and I was thrilled with that. I think that's really neat. Well, it's a part of our heritage, isn't Absolutely. it? And uh, it's not perhaps part of our daily lives anymore, but uh, when something like this happens, I think everyone uh, likes to take part. So let's let's talk about the park. Now, when I think of the Cinnaboyan Park, I think of the forest, I think of the the Great Park, I think of the zoo, and are you kind of involved in all those items, or...? Yeah, uh, the Conservancy uh, took over responsibility for the entire park. And so in my position as Chief Operations Officer, I really have uh, a broad base. You might say everyone that's involved in the construction and maintenance of what you see in the park. Uh, so it is uh, a fairly uh, diverse uh, set of activities. Uh, clearly, the major initiative of the last while has been the construction, and we will have invested over $100 million in the park by the time we open Journey to Churchill, and that's mm. in four and a half years. So that's a pretty aggressive uh, uh, campaign, a pretty aggressive construction schedule, but uh, just really the start of what we want to do over the next decade. Now, I have to admit, I'm going to admit it to you now, Shelly and I haven't been to the park in several years, and last time we were there, it needed some construction, and, and you know, and lots have happened, and we've read about lots, so we're, we're planning to go there tomorrow, because we thought, hey, you know what, we haven't gone there, you're on the show today, so Sunday we're going to go take a long walk because we have a cancer care walk coming up with this 20k walk so we got to start exercising sure so we thought let's go to the go check out the zoo check out the park and there's lots of things been happening over the last couple of years well if you go into the zoo you can't obviously go into the journey to Churchill construction site uh, because um, it is still a very active construction site mm-hmm. and a lot of work to do in the next eight weeks uh, but uh, you can uh, take in the rest of the, the the zoo you can see the construction from outside the site and if you go to Tundra Grill, which is actually a part of Journey to Churchill that opened this last year. Okay. You can enjoy lunch and uh, sit along the floor-to-ceiling glass that looks into one of the uh, polar bear exhibits. Um, it's only eight weeks away, and uh, Winnipeggers can sit there, have lunch, and watch polar bears uh, come right up to the window. So it's an Very. impressive experience. And that one exhibit alone, uh, we call it the Churchill Coast exhibit because it represents uh, the part of Churchill where the polar bears hang out in the fall waiting for the ice to form. Uh, that exhibit on its own is 20 times the size of the exhibit that Debbie, the last polar bear that we had in, in 
the zoo, mm-hmm. lived out her 42 years of, of life uh, at the zoo. 20 so times the 20 size. 20 times the mm-hmm. size. And it's one of three polar bear exhibits in Journey to Churchill. So this Journey to Churchill experience is actually going to be the most sophisticated um, and integrated uh, Arctic exhibit anywhere in the zoo world um, internationally. And we're very proud of that. Now, I have to come back to a point here. You said it's eight weeks away and there's lots of work to do. So, Don, are you concerned that you're not going to make it? We have to make it. Uh, we, we can't <laughs> oh, you afford, are concerned. We, we, we can't afford to be concerned. Uh, let's face it. We've been through the worst winter one possibly could have imagined. Fair enough. Uh, crews were working all winter long under insulated tarps. Um, I'm so glad that I was sitting in the office uh, looking at progress from the window and not trying to participate. Uh, uh, it's been a tough winter. It's been uh, a late spring. And now that the weather is finally beginning to uh, look more like spring and summer, uh, we're going flat out. It's going to be a rush to the finish, but we'll get there. It's two months away. It'll be fine. Yeah, and, you know, (laughs) any construction site, it seems that uh, for months and months and months, uh, lots of work and you don't see much for it, and then all of a sudden things come together. Uh, We're right at that stage, and uh, uh, we have nursery stock arriving next week. We have all of our seasonal gardeners back on staff. We are starting to lay... um, pathways uh, through the project. The inside work with the major buildings is nearing completion. Uh, I'm sure we'll get there. We just want, can we have eight weeks of nice, mild, seasonal, not too wet, uh, not too hot weather, and just get it done. I'm with you on that. We'll be right back with Don Peterkin, Chief Operations Officer of Cinnaboy Park Conservatory, after we take this break. Welcome back to Food and Friends. I've mentioned several times over the last couple of weeks, Manitoba Day is coming up, and Manitoba is going to be 144 years old. The Manitoba Act, which created the province of Manitoba, received royal assent on May, on May 12, 1870, making it Canada's fifth province. In 1986, May 12th was designated Manitoba Day. So we wondered how many Manitobans knew this, so we hired uh, Prairie Research Associates to conduct a survey in February of this year of Manitobans over 18 years of age. We asked one question, when is Manitoba Day? Okay, the results of the survey. Out of 814 Manitobans surveyed, only 33 people, or 4% of Manitobans knew Manitoba Day is May 12th. So 33 people out of 814. Despite Manitoba Day being around for 28 years, very few Manitobans know it even exists. I am a very, very proud Manitoban, and I talk about that on the show all the time. I talk about that on the street. I talk about that when we travel. I, I think Manitoba is a wonderful place. So I suggest on Monday, May 12th, let's take some time to celebrate Manitoba's 144th birthday and just celebrate how lucky we are to be born and living in this province. We're back with Don Peterkin, Chief Operations Officer of Assiniboine Park Conservancy. Don, Manitoba Day's coming up. You got a big thing with your family, friends, celebration, going out for coffee? What? I have to admit we don't. Uh, yeah. What we have is another busy day on a construction site. <laughs> That's right. Um, but um, You'll be we, celebrating getting one day closer to we, the opening. We will absolutely do that and uh, maybe take our five minutes to celebrate, then carry on. Please do. I, and I, I mean... I think, and I, I'm, I'm speaking, the pre- one of the jewels of our province is Assiniboine Park. I mean, whenever we have guests coming in from wherever the country or, or from the United States, a lot of people come in, we always drive them through the park. You know, we, we don't always have time to enjoy it because they're in for a day and they're out again. But they're always amazed by, by the park. And they can't get into the zoo, obviously, because we're just driving through. But it's an amazing park. It really is, you know, and there's so many different uh, things to see and do. Uh, it attracts such a wide range of people. Uh, the, the last attempt to quantify how many distinct visitors we have in the park every year, and this goes back a few years now, suggested the number was over 4 million. Really? And if you think of a community of three-quarters of a million um, having 4 million distinct users, now, that includes people that walk their dog in the park sure. uh, seven days a week and people that might come once every five years. But it really does mean we serve the entire community. And we just uh, have a, a few new managers we just hired out in our Calgary distribution center who were in town. And there's a reason I'm telling you the story. We were in town a couple weeks ago, and we went out to Gates on Roblin for dinner and, and wanted to treat them right. But what we did is drove through the park on the way because they had they'd been in Winnipeg 30 years ago. They were downtown, hadn't really seen much, and they were amazed at the park and how big it is. I talked about how many deer we have in that park. How many deer we have? 
Sometimes I think it's too many. <laughs> uh, it's interesting. We got yeah. lots of gardens through the park, as you know. Yes. And one of the challenges with the deer in the park, of course, is uh, gardens and deer don't necessarily get along well together. Uh, but um, uh, as much as we might curse them occasionally, we enjoy seeing them as much as anyone. And there's nothing like pulling into the park first thing in the morning and and uh, uh, have, coming around the corner and there's the deer uh, grazing along the side of the road. And you think, you know, a lot of people are in traffic jams going downtown to uh, pay for parking and spend their day in the downtown uh, uh, bustle. And here we are driving into the park. So we're pretty fortunate. Absolutely. And, and I, I think it's, I mean, the, the park was there. It's been there a long time. I don't know how many years it's been there. But somebody had foresight to put that park there. And now it's in the in the, in the the part of a city. And I, I think of New York City. It's got Central Park, which is, you know, part of the right downtown. But I can't think of too many cities that have such a beautiful park right within the city. I understand way back when, when the, the original city councilors voted in favor of setting up the park, they were very, very severely criticized and voted out of office at the first opportunity after that because of the expense and the, the absurdity of building or, or establishing the park where it was. So fast forward 100 years, and uh, thank God someone had that foresight to do that because uh, you'd never be able to uh, create that now. It's just uh, irreplaceable. And, and I, I think of Duff Roblin and building the uh, floodway, and he, I think he was criticized at the time as well from what I hear, and thank goodness we have the floodway. So there you go, sometimes so foresight. They, there's something to be said for being criticized for your decisions, right? It just takes a while for people to appreciate them. And, and I, th I think leadership, uh, as much as we criticize our political leaders, sometimes you need that leadership to look for the future. It, it's hard, you know, to look uh, 20, 30, 50, 100 years into the future and know what the needs will be. And now we look at the park and our responsibility with it, and it's really to make sure that not only can we bring it up to a modern standard, but you want to preserve that history at the same time and make sure that 50 and 100 years from now, there is still an Assiniboine Park for this city to enjoy. And I, I, I mentioned earlier that Shelley and I are doing the Cancer Care Walk for Life uh, coming up in June. And it starts in the park and ends in the park. And yes. there's much of downtown on that. It's 20K. Uh, but when you walk through the park, and I've driven through the park, we've walked through the park, done the zoo. But it's really a, such a beautiful area. You walk by some animals and the trees and the, the roadway that goes through there. It's, it's just, it's a real gem. I, I know I'm preaching the converted here. It is. And, you know, it's a real privilege for, I think, all of us involved with the Assiniboine Park Conservancy to to be involved and, and to be given the opportunity to steward the park through a redevelopment stage. Uh, when the Conservancy came into being, uh, there, it had been quite a while be since there had been some significant investment in park infrastructure. And I, I think it shows leadership on behalf of uh, the Mayor and City Council, as well as our board, to uh, come together and say we have to do something about this and, and make it better and this is a very forward looking model and I, there's, I can tell you there's a lot of municipalities across the country and even into the US that are watching what we're doing in terms of that, um, that private investment and that um, uh, not-for-profit involvement in running the park. It's, it's a leading-edge model. In, in the next half hour, we're going to talk about the investment that we're making, but we're also going to get some background on you and how did you end up getting in the park. But we'll, we'll talk about that next half hour. Uh, we'll be right back with Don Peterkin, Chief Operations Officer of the Assiniboine Park Conservancy, Conservancy after we take this break. Welcome back to Food and Friends. It's time for a recipe segment called Now We're Cooking. Now, as always, you don't need to write this recipe down as it's today's recipe of the day at peakmarket.com and it went in the Winnipeg Sun. So all the information is either on our website or in today's Winnipeg Sun. Today's recipe is garlic potato soup. Garlic potato soup. Okay, let's see what happens here. Here's what you need for the recipe. One large garlic bulb, two teaspoons of olive oil, two large leeks thinly sliced, one finely chopped uh, large onion, three cups of potatoes diced, for best results use Manitoba grown potatoes, five cups of vegetable or chicken stock, one bay leaf, and two thirds of a cup of light cream, as well as freshly grated nutmeg and salt and pepper to taste. Place the garlic cloves in a baking dish, lightly brush them with oil and bake at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes or until golden. Heat the remaining oil in a large skillet over medium heat. Add the leeks and onion, then cover and cook for about three minutes, stirring frequently until the veggies become softened. Add the potatoes, roasted garlic, stock, and bay leaf. Season with salt and pepper to taste. Then bring it to a boil, reduce the heat, cover and cook gently for about 30 minutes or until the vegetables are, are tender. 
Remove the bay leaf and let the soup cool slightly. Transfer to a blender and puree until smooth. Return soup to a pan and stir in cream and the nutmeg. And then heat right through. And this recipe serves for, again, today. this is today's recipe of the day at peakmarket.com and the Winnipeg Sun. And all the recipes on our website or in the newspaper have both metric and imperial measurements. We'll be right back with Don Peterkin, Chief Operations Officer of Assiniboine Park Conservancy, after we take this break for your 680 CWB News, uh, Sports and Weather. And we'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Food and Friends. Now, this is an exciting. We announced this last week, but Food and Friends is now on TV as well. We call it Food and Friends TV. Now, it's just it's the radio show that we're doing right now, but we have a camera in the studio, and it's it's being played uh, at mytoba.ca. So m y t o b a dot c a. So generally Sunday by after the show airs, they go back and they edit it and they put it on uh, mytoba.ca under My Life. You can watch us. As I stumble through the show, you can watch us uh, live. Uh, and I want to thank the teachers and students of Broadcasting and Media Arts at Tech Vock High School for their involvement. They're making this all happen. Of course, my Toba is the one that's posting it. But Chad, the camera guy, he's, uh, he's back there and he does a great job. Thank you, Chad, for everything you do. We're back with Don Peterkin, Chief Operations Officer at Cinnaboyne Park Conservancy. So, Don, we're going to be on TV as well. There you go. Yes. Special uh, special opportunity. A special opportunity. It's a high def, so they'll be able to see our faces. There you go. That's yeah, scary. they'll see me yeah. flipping through notes and stuff. It's, <laughs> yeah, it'll be, it'll be cool. See what this is all about. So, mytoba.ca, you can go there on Sunday and watch the show that we just did. If you want, Or you can go to soundcloud.com or iTunes and do a search for Food and Friends with Larry, and you can listen to us on either one of those places through podcasts. We'll make sure we do that. We're all over the technology. There you so, go. let's talk about you. How did you get involved with the Assiniboine Park? Well, uh, I uh, had been working for the Calgary Zoo for 28 oh. years when uh, one fateful day in September of 2009, I got a phone call from a um, um, uh, recruiter here in Winnipeg saying, we have a position profile we think you might be interested in. And I said, well, you know, I've been 28 years in this organization. I think I probably am going to finish my career here, but go ahead and send it to me. And uh, when it came, uh, it was very intriguing. Uh, the park, of course, is has a mixture of the zoo, uh, of gardens, um, a very uh, ambitious de- redevelopment plan. Uh, there was a mix of uh, unionized staff and non-unionized staff. There was a volunteer board, it's a not-for-profit. And um, I happened to have a horticulture background and worked for 28 years in a zoo setting, and I had been running the capital development program for Calgary, and uh, it was just a perfect fit. And so my wife and I sat down and had a very long heart-to-heart saying, should we do this or should we not? And decided, why not? And uh, I've, we've never looked back. We've loved every minute of it. It's been a tremendous opportunity. It's been a great opportunity for me to bring the experience I gained working in uh, the, the Calgary Zoo and bring it to Winnipeg and see Assiniboine Park come back to life. Now, the Calgary Zoo, Shelly and I have been there many times. It's a world-class zoo. It's it's a, it's amazing. Great corporate sponsorship, capital campaign. I guess you were part of that. Yes. And they've done some amazing things out there. But are you from Calgary originally? Actually, I grew up in Montreal. Oh, I went okay. to University of Ontario. Um, moved to Alberta way back in the boom years in the 70s. Um, uh, for a, a job at the time uh, in the horticulture industry and joined the zoo as the first curator of horticulture back in 1981. I hate to admit it, it's a lot of years ago now. Uh, so, so Montreal to Ontario to Calgary and then out to Winnipeg. To Winnipeg. So I've um, got around a little bit. I've got the chance to experience uh, four different parts of the country and uh, um you know, some people live their whole life in one community, and there's some real strengths with that in terms of long-term friendships and relationships and all, all the rest of it. Uh, and then there's the opportunity to experience different parts of the country, and uh, uh, that's the route that my life has taken. It still has to be hard um, after 28 years in Calgary or longer, I guess, for 28 years with the zoo, is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's so 32 in Calgary. 32 in Calgary to move. It was, but, you know, it was the adventure. And um, I've always thought you get ahead in this life and you make contributions by not being afraid to stick your neck out and go in a fresh direction. And uh, we were at the point in our lives where our kids were growing and it was just the two of us. And uh, the idea of doing this as sort of the last hurrah before it's time to think about packing it in, uh, it just seemed like the right thing to do. So you've been here uh, how many years now? Four and a half. Four years. and a half years. So you've you've seen the city, you've seen the province, 
and you've been through the winter, so all that's behind you now. Calgary had a tough winter last year, too. Yes. i got to tell you that. Yes. But uh, any regrets? No. Um, sure, there's times when you miss the people you left behind, and uh, you look at some of the things that uh, might have been had you stayed. Uh, the Calgary Zoo went through that terrible flood and oh, devastation right. last year. Mm -hmm. And had I stayed, I would have been front and center in sort of the recovery efforts and some of the planning for the rebuilding. Um, it's not that I would have looked forward to that, but it, it's many of the things that were destroyed were things that I was involved in the construction and, and development of. Right. And so you sort of feel a little bit of a tug that, um, you know, part of you has been lost uh, to that community. But the same token, we come here. Um, we've been uh, involved in some fantastic uh, projects. We've met great people. We've had a super time. And I think there's probably not a better time to come to Manitoba than the last several years. And there's lots of economies doing well compared to the rest of the country, certainly compared to the United States. Uh, we're reinvesting in, in so many things, the Human Rights Museum, Cinnaboyan Park, and it go, the list goes on and on and on of things we're reinvesting in. So that has to be exciting for you with all with that money coming in. And, and frankly, we needed to reinvest in the zoo. We, re, we need to reinvest in our city in many ways, but the zoo especially. So it's great that businesses have come forward and, and made donations that enabled you to do a lot of things you're doing. Absolutely. And, and the level of support, uh, grassroots support in this community, uh, is absolutely outstanding. Very, very different community, Calgary to Winnipeg. Um, uh, Calgary, perhaps a little bit more uh, business oriented and flashy and sort of current. Um, everything is the latest and greatest and oil patch driven and all the rest of it. You could say they have oil, yeah. <laughs> uh, it makes a difference. Yeah. Um, but Winnipeg, uh, it's a lot more, um, uh, I guess, uh, old tradition, families that have been here their whole lives, people wanting to reinvest in the community, not because it's the thing to do um, uh, as, as corporate responsibility, but because they truly believe in what they're investing in. And so it's been uh, uh, a very pleasant exercise from that perspective. And here we are having uh, invested over $100 million in the park in four and a half years and more plans into the future. So uh, it's happening. And I almost get the sense that I arrived in Calgary in the late 70s when it was sort of going through that first real boost of, of energy and redevelopment and, and growth. And now coming to Winnipeg, it's sort of Winnipeg's turn. There's some many, many good things going on in the community. And um, the park's just a part of it. And we're, we're just so pleased to be, uh, uh, I guess, one of the uh, success stories of the last number of years. So what do you see as your biggest challenge coming up in the next year? Well, it's interesting. Uh, we've been so focused on uh, these major construction projects. Um, we were into design of Journey to Churchill almost the day I arrived, and here it is four and a half years later, and we're starting to open it. Um, the, the challenge now, of course, is you have to turn it in for, to, uh, from a construction site into an operating facility, and it's a whole different set of challenges. Right. Uh, clearly, we need to uh, maximize the value that uh, that we have um, uh, developed with the facility. We have to uh, ensure that we uh, provide a super experience for Winnipeggers and, and promote it as a tourism attraction. But we've also now set an expectation. We've set the bar high, and this project is going to be fantastic. People are going to be blown away. But now, of course, they're going to expect that with everything. And uh, we have to sort of regather ourselves and look to what's next and uh, move forward. There's nothing wrong with setting the bar high. <laughs> we'll be right back with Don Peterkin, Chief Operations Officer of Cinema Park Conservancy, after we take this break. Welcome back to Food and Friends. I have very exciting news. Peak of the Market is holding auditions for kids that want to be in one of our TV commercials. Now, Whenever I'm out and about, and we've had TV commercials with kids for many, many years, I'm out and about, kids come up to me and say, can I be in your commercials? And this summer, we're, we're redoing our commercials. We're doing four new commercials. So we thought, well, why don't we do something different? Let's open it up for children 6 to 12 years old. If they want to audition, they can come down to Polo Park uh, Shopping Center on May 31st. And I'll be there all day. And what, what happens, basically, is you have to come down with your parent uh, or legal guardian, sign off a waiver, and do an audition and we're going to, I'll be there all day doing uh, auditions with every child and uh, each child will receive uh, a copy of their audition with me. 
by a, by a YouTube, a private YouTube, so only you can get to it, it'll be password protected. And then we'll choose four uh, kids to be in our Peak of the Market TV commercials that'll be filmed this summer. So lots of details to go through there, but if you go to our website, peakmarket.com, you'll see all the information about when the commercials are going to be filmed and all about the script and everything is on there. So check out the website if you're interested, and that's for children 6 to 12 years old at Polo Park Shopping Centre on May 31st. Should be a lot of fun. We're back with Peter, uh, sorry, Don Peterkin, Chief Operations Officer at Cinnaboyne Park Conservancy. See, I'm so worried about conservancy again that I just skipped your name. There I'm you sorry go. about that. No problem. We were talking during the commercial break, the journey to church. So, that, so kind of walk through what we're going to see July 3rd. Well, we don't want to give it all away. Oh, come on, uh, give it away. Right but, here on Food and Friends. But I can tell you that people will never have seen a zoo exhibit like this before. I like to think it's a cross between a traditional zoo exhibit and a science center. Um, we have invested over six and a half million dollars on the interpretive program, the educational elements in this project. We have included elements of northern peoples as well as the animals of the north. Uh, we have a 360 degree film that's been custom um, filmed for us by Science North out of Sudbury that will be shown in our Aurora Borealis Theater on a 10 minute um, cycle. Um, we have three separate polar bear exhibits. Um, ultimately, we'll house up to 12 polar bears. Uh, we have four at present, okay. and that number will grow slowly over the next number of years. Uh, we'll have seals on exhibit for the first time, uh, spacious new exhibits for the snowy owls, the arctic fox, the musk ox, the caribou. Uh, we're going to do things that haven't really been done before, uh, certainly in Canada, and it's just starting to happen in a few zoos around the world. We've got what we call our positive reinforcement training area, where we will show, uh, put on a, sh well, not a show, but we'll demonstrate to the public how we go about training polar bears to do some of the uh, behaviors that we want so that we can provide them with the appropriate care. Hmm. For example... Historically, if you needed to do a dental check on a polar bear, you had to mobilize that animal. And there's always a risk with that. Well, now we have trained those animals on command to open their mouth and uh, show us their teeth. Or we can get to the point where we can draw a blood sample from the hip of a polar bear while it's fully conscious and awake. And we're going to do that in front of the public. And so people will see the dedication of the keepers and the processes that we use to um, manage the animals uh, in the least stressful uh, manner. I, and I find that very interesting. Shelley and I have been fortunate enough to go to Churchill and see the, the polar bears, and I've often talked about it on the show, and they look cuddly, and you know, but they're they're wild animals, right? So I, I'm kind of I'm interested in how you could possibly do that where they open their mouths and let you do a tunnel checkup. Well, <laughs> we what we do is uh, using food as a reward, we encourage the behaviors we want and discourage the behaviors we don't. So, for example, if the polar bear comes up to the mesh close to the keeper, um, then we would use a clicker and we'll have a little click, uh, which is a reinforcement, mm -hmm. and a little tidbit of fish. And so pretty soon the bear realizes that um, if I, um, I come up to the mesh when I'm called, I'll get my treat. Uh, then we'll, we'll have that bear, if the bear goes to stand up, for example, we'll click and reward that behavior, and pretty soon the bear will stand up for us. The bear will open its mouth for us. The bear will put his hip against the, the mesh so we can draw a blood sample. Um, but the animal only does it if they want to do it. And there's times when they won't. Sure. Um, but positive reinforcement training, it's really rewarding, a positive uh, reward for the behaviors you want. And then you take the stress out of it for the keeper and the animal. And uh, so we want to do that in front of the public. And so people understand what goes into it. Um, we have three separate polar bear exhibits in this development. And uh, with the four polar bears that we'll start with, each day those bears will be paired with a different animal in a different space. So it could be one day bears one and two are together in the deep swimming pool at 16 feet deep, uh, and three or four in one of the other exhibits. Then later in the day, one and three are together. Uh, so by the time you get uh, six, eight, 10, 12 polar bears and three exhibits, you've got all these permutations and combinations. And polar bears, by nature, they don't like spending time with each other, do they? Well, in the wild, uh, certainly they, they congregate in Churchill and hang out in pretty close proximity. Okay. Females with young and males are an absolute no-no. And okay. so eventually we'll have breeding and that will force us to, to keep certain animals away from other animals. Mm. But uh, in, a, in a setting where they're not competing for food um, and uh, they get a chance to socialize with each other, uh, generally speaking, 
they're they're uh, fairly compatible. Not necessarily if a female's in heat and you've got two mature males, but uh, uh, for most of the season. Now I've seen sketches of the whole uh, journey to Churchill area. It looks it looks amazing, and I can't I can't quite imagine what it's going to look like when it's actually done. But it it sounds incredible. Well, someone asked me the other day what I think is going to be the number one experience, and uh, I think it's going to be the acrylic tunnel that runs through the polar bear and seal pool. So it's a 16-foot deep pool, half a million gallons of salt water, and the bears will actually swim right down to the bottom of that 16-foot pool. So you can be standing there and watch the bear swim below your feet, Hmm. Um, or you can watch uh, the seals watch the bears through the acrylic that separates the two. Uh, That tunnel is going to be spectacular. Now, the other thing is we have to teach people how to use the exhibit. This is not like the old zoo exhibit where you have cages lined up in a row and you go this animal to the next animal to the next animal. Right. You have to look for them more like you would in the wild, and uh, that's going to be something that's a bit of an adjustment for visitors, but we'll, we'll work with them and get them through it. That sounds amazing. We'll be right back with Don Peterkin, a Chief Operations Officer of Cinnaboy Park Conservancy, after we take this break. Welcome back to Food and Friends. My guest today is being Don Peterkin, Chief Operations Officer of Assiniboine Park Conservancy. Don, this, is, this has been a lot of fun, uh, learning about the zoo, learning about the park. Uh, it's, it's been an amazing times there. Well, you know, it's been a lot of work uh, over the last couple of years with construction and the communities put up with this disruption in the middle of the zoo and still come out in record numbers. And we just can't wait for the opportunity to turn them loose and let them see what it's been all about. And that's July 3rd when that opened. July 3rd. That's uh, it's not that far away. No, it's coming far too fast. Far too fast. Uh, it's it's going to be amazing. But of course, the the park is a beautiful place. The zoo's open now too. You can you can check it out. There's lots to do at the park. So, you know, when these these beautiful days are coming up, I'm I'm very hopeful of that because it's good growing season. You want to get out to the park. Thank you, Don, for being on Food and Friends. My pleasure. Next Saturday, my guest will be Darren Dunn, Chief Executive Officer at Assiniboine and Downs. Happy Mother's Day, everybody, and thanks to Nicole Blonnie Camp, our show's producer. Take care and please don't forget. Get to eat your veggies.